Welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. March 18th marks the 100th anniversary of the deadliest tornado ever to occur in the United States, the Tri-State Tornado that went through parts of Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana, killing 695 people. Today, we're going to take a deeper dive into this storm and learn a little bit about it. We're talking today with Steve Piltz. He's a meteorologist in charge at the uh, Tulsa National Weather Service and actually was part of a big reanalysis project on this tornado and even has a little family connection to it as well. So, Steve, first of all, thanks for joining us. If for people that don't know, what was the kind of path of this storm and areas that were impacted by this tri-state tornado? Well, it ran from southeast Missouri across the length of southern Illinois and then dissipated in southwest Indiana. So it, it went across three states um, and it was it was moving fast. It was wide and it still holds some of the records for for fatalities in a town, fatalities in a school. It's a, it's still a, a history making event. So overall length, it was about over 200 miles long. How, how wide was that tornado as it went went through those areas? About a mile or so. I mean, plus or minus a little bit. It was it would be what today the storm chasers would call a wedge tornado. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> to yeah. see something like that and be that long. Um, speed wise, was was this a, a fast moving tornado that went through these areas? It was. You know, average speed was near 60 miles an hour, but there were times it may have been closer to 70, and so it was moving easily a mile a minute through most of its path. Well, with a storm like this, and you're also talking 1925, so this is pre-radar that we could use, pre-even the National Weather Service the office you're at. Uh, were those, was there much warning or in advance or anything people could prepare for this storm? Not really. There was, it just, it just kind of evolved. It was right there at the, the, the time when technology was just starting to take off. Radio stations were starting to become more of them across the country. I think there, I only saw two on the list around the path, and so there really wasn't anything in place. There was conversations with the Weather Bureau afterwards that we should at least have some kind of phone alert system where one town knows how to call the next town and, and have some type of alarm and alert, but that did, that wasn't in place in 1925. So when you're talking 695 people dead there, there was mass destruction in that. So there was a 40 minute stretch as the storm was moving through Illinois uh, that it impacted uh, towns like Murfreesboro, DeSoto, 541 people dying in 40 minutes. I mean, really those towns there, I'm speaking of Murphy Bureau particularly, how, how much was the destruction just devastating in that area? Well, you know, the tornado went across from the southwest across the north and northeast part of town, but then there were tremendous winds on the south side of the tornado as well that today we'd call it rear flank downdraft winds, but there was also a lot of damage there. So really the entire town was damaged from the storm, but the, the most intense damage was across the north part of town. And then as would be the case back then, uh, fires broke out because the storm scattered the, the various stoves, the wood-burning, coal-burning stoves that they had, and so fires became an issue then for the next day or two. So it was just, it was just one of the nastiest scenes you could imagine. And with this being an early afternoon storm, and again, lack of really preparedness, uh, schools became a big issue where they got hit by this uh, tornado as well, right? That's right. I think the, the death toll at DeSoto still remains the, the largest loss of life in a tornado at a school. And so I think Murfreesboro still holds the record for the largest loss of life in a community. So those are and those two communities are just a few miles apart. So the tornado was very intense at that point and, and very wide and and the destruction was just incredible. So there's 234 people killed in the town of Murfreesboro. You have personal connection, family history of this storm where your family lost some people in the storm, right? That's right. And, you know, it, it all happened well before me, but I knew some of the stories. And and so my dad's mother and his younger brother died. And then not that far across town, my mom's mom was was severely injured and she lost two daughters. So my, my mom, who wasn't born yet by the time of the storm, but still she lost two sisters in the storm. And then her grandmother that she would never know was also killed in the storm. So we had we had a number of number of deaths on both sides of my family tree. Wow. Um, so you've got a connection to it. Now you're a meteorologist learning more about weather. Tell me about this reanalysis project that y'all started to kind of look back and learn more about this historic storm. Well, you know, it was driven by some some really famous folks in, in, in the as far as the meteorological community cons is concerned. Um, Maddox, Doswell, Burgess, those are three anchor names that if you're a meteorologist, you know that they contributed so much uh, to the development of our modern understanding of, of meteorology and then some of the instrumentation. And so I think it, it was kind of driven from them to say, you know, there, there hasn't been much, there wasn't a lot written back then. They did, they collected all they had, but you know, they didn't have satellite, they didn't have radar. So um, the, the descriptions were a little bit incomplete and didn't completely follow what we think the model for, for this type of storm would be. And so several of us that really went across the countryside and we were not just accepting well, the tornado was on the ground from here to there. We wanted to talk to people 
who saw the storm or find an exact account or exact picture so that we could put a dot on the map and we could try to show the evidence of this was the path. And then, of course, we were looking to see was it one tornado or was it not? So 219 mile path of it. Did you all find anything that proved that this possibly was one tornado or it could be multiple sales produced or multiple tornadoes produced by one particular supercell storm? Well, there was about a 10 mile gap in southeast Missouri, but that was right across the St. Francis Mountains. And so there wasn't a lot of expectation to find a, a, a record of damage in there anyway. And so I always just use the football analogy uh, that the ruling on the field stands, that we didn't find anything that dramatically suggested that it was more than one tornado. Of course, looking back at that time, like 75 years back in the past, you know you weren't going to find uh, just this hard evidence one way or the other probably, but we saw nothing that suggested that it was anything more than, than a one, a one tornado within that path. So tornadoes are known to really be what we call cyclical, meaning where they kind of fluctuate in uh, strength. The, everything looks like this storm stayed strong nearly the entire path. How rare is it for a storm, a tornado to stay that strong, that big for that in, a long of a time? You know, it, it's, it's at the top of the top of the list for, for things like that. Um, the Mayfield tornado that occurred in western Kentucky, and actually there was uh, prior tornadoes coming out of uh, the Missouri Boot Hill in northeast Arkansas, and so that's kind of a close analogy. It broke for a short time in its path, but still there was a lot of, it was, it was a pretty similar, pretty similar path and or pretty similar type of uh, situation. So uh, we know it happens, you know, today we see some of that, but still the, the tri-state tornado holds the records for the path length. and. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's just extremely rare because typically you'd see it cycling. And I think in part of our reanalysis, we thought maybe we saw an early tornado that did cycle, but that point was actually further west than the historic beginning of the tri-state tornado. So it didn't change the numbers really. So the official forecast from the uh, Weather Bureau that day was rain and strong shifting winds. Fast forward 100 years, now we've got the National Weather Service where you work, Storm Prediction Center. How different would the uh, communication be and advance warning be for something, uh, a storm system potentially like this? It would be vastly different. I mean, it would have been talked about for several days in advance. So the, the communities in the path would have been on a heightened level. A credit watch would have been in effect for it. Um, media folks would have, would, would have instantly gone into, into really expanded coverage once the, the tornado was obvious and moving. And, and it was the, the single tornado that crossed in there. It wasn't like that there were multiple tornadoes also going on around us. So there'd have been a lot of attention the media would be able to focus on and give to that. And so everything would have been in place and you have emergency management and uh, responders that would have had spotters in the area, also radio and information. And so, and of course, storm chasers, there probably would have been live video off and on through the path. And so um, it would have been just night and day difference between now and then. So when you look at the uh, top 10 list of uh, deadliest tornadoes, this one's the number one, but most of them were pre-1953. 1953, you had the Waco tornado and the Flint, Michigan tornado, and I know there's a lot of work that was started that year. So other than the Joplin, Missouri tornado back in 2011, is it more that we're seeing just the better notification and learning, or is there some where the buildings are getting stronger as well to handle some of these style storms? Oh, I think you're exactly right. I think the building building codes and understanding how to be a little bit stronger um, makes a big difference as well as all the warning and all the communication that we do. Uh, it really doesn't take that much extra money if you're building a home to add to things like hurricane clips in the attic and, and extra bolts and anchoring in the, in the foundation to, to take a, a house that would disintegrate pretty quickly and take it to one that's going to withstand quite a bit. And so, like, you know, nothing really can withstand an F4, F5 type of tornado, but there's a lot of tornadoes that are EF1, EF2, EF3 that are that do a lot of damage too, and, and some of that could be mitigated and has been mitigated as we've made our building stronger. So we've, you know, 100 years since this storm, but even here in the last few days, we've had some significant severe storms. And uh, how much, this may, hopefully could be a good reminder to folks of how being prepared and knowing how to get weather information, how important that is as we head into severe weather season. Right, I mean, we've had, we've had a couple bad days and we're just now starting off the spring. So this, it is the good reminder to say, really stay connected. I mean, folks will kind of generally know if, if they're just watching any type of news coverage at all. They, they know that certain days are being highlighted for, for, for significant severe weather potential. But then on that day, stay connected. Have that way to, to be alarmed, whether it's an app on your phone or you have a, an ability to, to keep, uh, keep in close contact and watching local media and, and not be off somewhere where you're watching a recorded program and, and you're not going to be able to get alarms. And so that's something to know. And also know, too, that sirens really are for folks outdoors and don't rely on them you know, for being indoors because the 
it's it's easy to easy to miss that if you're asleep and we've all tried to make our homes a little bit more weatherproof so that's keeping the sound out as well so having multiple ways to get that information is, is a must very interesting uh, work that y'all have done about it and i appreciate you kind of shedding a little light on this historic storm sure it's glad to do it